And um, can you tell me about the audience? Like, is it okay. parents, <laughs> teachers, kids? We have a teacher, we have a parent, we have a number of students, uh, and these students, they are, uh, they always uh, join the, our cook session online, and they are really motivated children. And, uh, but I think they are, they may be having a, uh, um, like a kind of narrow scope about what is coding or the, the platform they're using. So maybe I would like uh, to have your advice and your experience to let us know more about the, uh, what you're actually seeing uh, in this uh, coding uh, like, uh, adventure for, for young students, especially in uh, in US and also because uh, your platform is uh, like, a, like a kind of advocating coding around the whole world. So I, I'm sure you have a lot to share with us, yes. Yeah, so thanks so much. And I'm, I'm so sorry to be late. Uh, one thing I'm gonna say is if, if you tell me how many people uh, participated tonight. I'm going to send everybody stickers uh, so that uh, to, to make up for being late because I hate being late. <laughs> no problem at all. Uh, we have, uh, we have, yeah. At the moment, we have uh, more than 10 people. And uh, okay. so, so we, I believe for some of them, they are, they are joining us in a minute. But uh, I think, as I said, the session will be recorded. So we expect to have more people uh, listen to your sharing today. Yes. Okay, great. Well, look, feel free to ask questions. I was going to um, share a little bit of uh, the, the history of CodeSpark and kind of, you know, why we do what we do and, and our growth. And then, um, you know, maybe if there's questions about the platform itself, I can answer some of those questions. Does that sound good? Sounds great. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to share my screen. We'll see if this works here. Yes, you can share screen, please. Yep, it looks like it's happening. Okay. Um, and here we go. Uh, can you see happy kids? Yes, we have seen uh, many happy kids, especially on uh, <laughs> the left side. I think he is uh, one or two years old. Yeah, and, and he's, I think he might actually be uh, a boy who lived I, he's definitely uh from china and i'm trying to remember if it was guangzhou or hong kong but it's a friend's son <laughs> who, oh. who's yeah he started playing when he was very young he plays with his dad um <laughs> so look I, i'll go pretty fast uh but I, I think you know what the world is changing really quickly right and one of the statistics that's interesting to me is that um internet uh, connected devices are soon going to be everywhere, literally everywhere we go, right? And I think China is probably ahead of the rest of the world uh, in this regard, and uh, Hong Kong especially. Uh, by 2035, it's estimated that there will be 100 billion uh, internet connected devices. And so more than ever, software is truly going to run the world. And that's why, uh, that's part of why we believe, you know, coding is so important. Um, and it's, you know, we talk about coding as the new English, meaning it's a literacy that every child needs to succeed. And I, I know that you already believe that, but it's interesting that this is a global movement, right? Uh, 37 countries have adopted computer science standards uh, that are mandatory for K through 12. And um, in addition, uh, almost every state now in the United States has adopted these same standards. Um, and uh, most importantly in the US, our 60 biggest school districts have adopted these standards and are really leading the way uh, when it comes to teaching computer science in the US. And that's about half of all US students. These are uh, my daughters and they are the original inspiration for CodeSpark. So uh, this is the exact age they were when they asked me how computers work. And Naomi, my six-year-old on the right, she was particularly interested in computers. And I went looking for an ABCs of computer science. I thought there must be an introduction that would make sense for young kids. And I was very surprised when I couldn't find anything. So, you know, when I thought about computer science, it made sense to me that kids would start when they're young and build a foundation throughout their school career. Um, and so that's what we've created, right? 
And I'm not going to talk about my background. Basically, I'm a finance guy who, who turned into a data guy. And my partner worked for Disney for almost 13 years, building uh, big, successful kids' experiences. That's probably all you need to know about us. Um, but you know, we've created what we think of as the ABCs of coding, and there's two pieces to it. There's the platform that you see when you download the app. And then for public school teachers, there's a teacher dashboard that allows teachers to set up classrooms, um, access curriculum, and access professional development. Our community is about two and a half million um, kid coders who access the app every month. Uh, during Hour of Code, that goes as high as five million in a month. And 53% of those kids are girls. So very even split. Uh, and those numbers are worldwide. We have users in about 190 countries worldwide, and they're making 40,000 games and stories every day. Um, so far, we've reached already over 30 million kids uh, and 87,000 teachers in the US. And I think one thing that's important, especially for parents who are focused on education, um, our product is research-based. And we work with the Department of Education and the United States and very well-known research groups like RAND Corporation and UCLA um, to make sure that our platform actually teaches the concepts that we say it teaches. Um, one of the reasons kids like the platform is because we have this universe of characters that are fun, right? Um, and you have to solve problems with these characters, so it's story-based. Um, you know, the glitch, the little blue monster at the top right, he's often causing problems in the app, and then the kids have to fix it. <laughs> um, you know, we have, we talked about, we have lots of teacher resources, we support public te school teachers around the world. Um, the other thing I'm going to talk about is that the core of the app, and, and this is probably what's most important to me, is uh, using code creatively. So we do have puzzles that teach core concepts um, and they're good puzzles and, and we're proud of them, but really the puzzles are designed to prepare you to go into our creative tools and make cool games and interesting stories. Um, the entire interface is drag and drop and there's really no words uh, in the interface. So you don't have to be able to read and you don't have to be able to speak English in order to use the app. And that's what's helped make the app popular in many countries around the world. Uh, we have lots of activities, you know, here's, here's a little example of stories. When you're, when you're in game design, currently uh, the games that you can design are kind of Mario, like Super Mario style, um, what's called a side-scrolling game, um, but kids get very creative with it and they, they really push the platform to do different things. We've seen kids create everything from pachinko games to uh, like coordinated dance parties. Um, you know, one of the things that we, we love is watching kids build increasingly sophisticated games the more they use it. Um, this is a student actually in Japan, it was an eight-year-old girl, who the first game she published didn't really make a lot of sense and, and nobody copied it. They, you know, in our platform, if you think a game is interesting, you can copy it and go look at that person's code. And that's how kids learn from each other. Um, her 28th game was remixed 17 times, so 17 people thought it was interesting enough to to take a look at her code. And then by her 61st game, she built such an elaborate and interesting game that 13,000 people <laughs> remixed that game and took a look at her code. And uh, I remember playing this game, one of the things that she developed was that the bunny uh, at the bottom of the screen uh, would break through the bricks eat the carrot and then transform into another character. <laughs> she had some really cool, you know, sophisticated code. Um, in our, in our story-based uh, creative tools, 
you know, we're seeing kids uh, engage in a lot of self-expression. And it's interesting, the stories that they make uh, generally reflect what's happening in society. So, for example, when there were protests in Hong Kong recently, I looked and we, we saw some stories about kids, you know, talking about protests. There's protests here in the United States about Black Lives Matter. Um, kids are writing stories about that. They're writing stories about washing their hands because of COVID-19, you know. Um, so it, it gives them a platform to, sure, tell a story that's either funny or serious or about their family or about their pet, but it also allows them to express themselves about, you know, uh, things that are part of the news cycle that they think about. And sometimes we don't always give kids enough of a chance to express themselves in this way. So, you know, we love seeing that. Um, you know, this is just more about how the story platform works. I'm not going to go too much into that, except um, one thing that we see kids use a lot is they can record their own voice in their stories so they can actually act out the different characters. Um, and they can also create like talking bubbles. Um, one thing I should emphasize is that as you know, we care very much about privacy and safety on our platform. And so uh, we have two levels of review for every story that's published into our community. The first level is computerized filters that look for, you know, phone numbers and bad words and things that just shouldn't be there. Um, and then every story is actually reviewed by a person. Um, and we make sure that the story is appropriate and, and safe. So that's something we care about a lot. And uh, throughout the app, we have a lot of different safety features to protect the kids who are using it. Um, you know, some of our partners around the world include Apple. And as a matter of fact, if you log into the Apple App Store today, we happen to be app of the day today uh, in, well, in the US, I guess I'm not exactly sure if that we're app of the day in Hong Kong, but, but in the US, we're app of the day. Um, hour of Code is a, you know, as you know, in, in the US, it's in December, we've been an Hour of Code partner for uh, five years. I'm on the Hour of Code advisory board, so we're very involved with that. Um, Girl Scouts is a service organization in the US with two million members, and we did merit badges for them around coding. And then Code Ninjas is an after-school program that's uh, growing fast in the U.S. They have about 300 locations. Um, we power a program for young kids. So, you know, our general philosophy about coding is that coding is for problem solving and self-expression. And that really to be prepared for the future, kids... Um, need coding plus creativity and problem solving skills, right? And so that's what we try to teach on the platform. Um, so let me take a break. That's a lot of information. I would be happy to answer questions. I don't know if people have the ability to write in questions. Of course, Grant, um, a lot of important information and I'm sure uh, the audience here, they would like to ask questions. Feel free to type uh, your question in the uh, chat room or unmute yourself uh, to, to voice out. <clears throat> so maybe I can start with my first question, Grant. Sure. Um, you mentioned about the uh, China market. You say uh, the China market is uh, growing really fast. How, how do you see the China like a market? I mean, the, the coding of the parent, do they appear to be even more aggressively uh, pushing their children to learn coding or as compared to the US or you think it's uh, just the same? No, I think it's maybe even in some ways more aggressive in the in China and um, uh, kids are also being pushed to learn um, text based coding at an earlier age, which uh, Well, let me tell you why we don't uh, love that idea. Um, you know, I think there's a perception that text based coding is quote real coding right, which is partly true. But the reality is, if you, if you think about reading, for example, nobody starts reading by, you know, reading Shakespeare or 
Herman Melville or the three body problem, right? Like they, they start by reading very simple books because they're trying to learn concepts and really focus on uh, the logic of, of what they're doing. Same with math, right? Nobody starts their math career with calculus, <laughs> right? Um, the, the, the downside of rushing kids into text-based coding when they're very young is that you have to deal with a lot of things that are quite frustrating that don't have anything to do with learning. You know, so syntax, for example, worrying about where your semicolon goes is not very interesting for a five-year-old, right? It, it's kind of a dumb problem to make them consider. Um, so we, the reason we built our visual coding language is that so we could focus on the underlying logic that is the same for all text-based languages like loops, conditionals, et cetera. Um, so that's one, you know, and I think that's all over the place around the world, but in general, I would just say it's really healthy to start with visual-based coding and let kids move to text-based coding when they're really, you know, asking for it, basically, right? If that makes sense. Um, one thing I've seen in China that's cool that, that gives me um, hope about what we're doing is when kids program a game on our platform and then they show that game to their parent, the parent gets really excited, right? Because they understand that the child has made some really interesting choices around how the game works, what the goal of the game is, uh, how the bad guys function, etc. And so they understand that there's a lot of important like learning and, and um, you know, thoughtful strategic choices happening. Um, so, so we focus on that. But I think uh, in general, China's in a good place for coding education. You know, people seem to get that it's very important. My only concern is that people will try to make it too serious too young and it'll kill the fun, right? Um, you know, what you don't want to do is have, you know, a kid who by sixth grade is already annoyed by coding, right? Because they were forced to do some really hardcore coding really early. Um, you know, it's, it's like a lot of things. They should be able to do things that are interesting to them um, and that hold their attention. And usually it has to be fun to hold their attention. Absolutely. Um, my second question uh, is about uh, how you see this kind of a uh, learning uh, platform, like a, a parent with the iPad, they can learn at home, connected to the like the school curriculum. So you know, there's yeah. uh, always a gap. And uh, how, how do you see uh, this kind of a uh, platform uh, position? Well, yes. I mean, I can tell you our usage has doubled in 90 days. So um, you know, we're kind of built to. Uh, be useful in a pandemic, right? <laughs> we have kids are using the platform at school, kids are using the platform at home. Um, I think maybe the bigger part of your question is, you know, what's going to happen going forward? I think school is going to change forever. I think parents, kids, and teachers will be more comfortable with online learning. Um, not everything works with online learning right? Some things should be in person. I would be the first per to say that. However, I think people will be more open to the idea that many things could be okay with online learning. But is that your question or, you know, were you really asking me something different? Yes, exactly. I would like to see how this kind of online learning at home is influencing the student as well as connected to the curriculum at school. So this is... Uh, yeah. I, want to know in I, I think I think one of the big challenges for companies like CodeSpark is that we need to do more work now in this new uh, kind of normal where where parents are more involved at home. We need to create um, better resources that give parents an increased understanding of what we're doing and why we do it so that if they need to help their child, they can. Um, and we need to make it easy for the parent. It can't be too long. It can't be too, it can't be boring, you know? So 
I think that will be a big challenge for ed tech companies, educational technology companies in general, is to make sure that not only do they have support for teachers, but they have good support for parents. And I think generally the products in the market today have one or the other. Either they think about teachers, but not parents, or they think about parents, but not teachers. And they're going to have to think about both. Cool. Uh, I always have a lot of questions. I would like to see open the floor. Is there any uh, student? I mean, uh, Andrew, Aaron, and uh, let me see. I see there's uh, Brian, uh, there's uh, T.S. Fong. Is he a teacher? Yeah, I think. So please uh, feel free to voice out your question. Let me continue uh, one first. Uh, Grant, uh, you mentioned about you have this uh, very strong research uh, base uh, in this education. You have UCLA, you've got a couple of uh, entities supporting uh, this uh, mission. So how do you measure the children uh, in, in, within the app to figure out oh. he or she has acquired certain computational thinking skill and what is missing? How do you enhance that in this platform? Yeah, so there's two things we do. So one, we have a learning metric that we've defined that we measure daily. Um, and the, that looks at uh, several different elements of a student's progress in the app. So we look at how far they've gone in the puzzles, how many stars they're getting in the puzzles. We look at when they're creating, how many commands do they use? And do they seem to use those commands correctly? Um, so we have this measure of learning that we track on our own. That's, that's one way. Another way is we do formal studies in uh, school classrooms where we test the kids on their computational thinking knowledge before they use CodeSpark Academy. And then we have them do um, usually like a month to two months of lessons, either once or twice a week, and then we measure them again. Um, and so far the results have been, you know, very strong. Um, and then the third way is we design small tests that the teachers can give to see if the students really are learning a particular concept. Hi, so who's your super coder there with you? My daughter, Racy, she's a fan of a Coast Park. Racy, you have a question Hi. for Uncle Grant, right? What's your question? Can I teach my little brother coding with Coast Park? Yeah, how old is your little brother? How old? Three. Three. Yes. yes. Oh. oh. Three. Well, I bet you could, you know, it's going to be a little bit hard for him, but maybe if you help him, then he could start to learn it, right? Because I bet you're a very good coder now. Are you? Are you a good coder? Yes. <laughs> she's confident. At least she's enjoying it. I think that's the best I like part. it. Well, you know, I, I designed the CodeSpark for my own daughter. So every time I see a, a girl coder using it, I love it. That's great. <laughs> okay, okay. She's happy with that. <laughs> and I, I totally agree with you that we have to uh, keep our children falling in love with uh, whatever they're doing, uh, but not like, uh, uh, like uh, getting to the other end. And uh, you, you also mentioned about uh, this, uh, this, this platform. Uh, I, will, I have a question. Let me see. Ellen. Yeah. Ellen. All right, so my question is uh, about the uh, exit point. So obviously, uh, COSPA uh, cannot, I mean, it's not targeting people at all age because uh, at the end, right. children, they are going to transform and uh, continue their learning journey. So what is the exit, exit point or exit strategy of, uh, of uh, COSPA? We would like to know that more from you. Yeah, so the, you know, currently someone who kind of, let's say, graduates from CodeSpark Academy, right, and is ready for the next step, would either go to Scratch or like basic Python or JavaScript. But for, do you mean exit strategy for us as a company? Um, I would like to know more about as a, as a coder. So how do they yeah. turn into another like a continuous learning journey and how do you see that? Yeah, so, but the, the long-term answer is we're actually starting work on an app for preschool students and yeah. an app for and an app for older students that will introduce text-based coding for the first time. So I would say those products realistically will not be ready until close to the end of next year. But um, eventually we will have three products, and you'll be able to 
go on your coding journey with us from about age three to age, you know, 12 or 13. Well, wonderful. So it sounds like you have uh, uh, quite a number of uh, major component being a constructor at the moment. So we have a KC, uh, uh, this question, uh, can you see that or I can repeat? Can uh, I saw it briefly, it looked like how to, how, what's the best way to inspire kids to start coding? Yeah, is there many is right? questions for, for kids? Yeah, uh, so it depends on the age and I, yeah, let me see if I can see that. Oh, there we go. Um, how to inspire there. Oh, I see. Yeah, so this is, look, you're right. There's many things that kids like to do, right? And so that was part of the reason we designed CodeSpark the way we did is because we know that they could play Minecraft or watch TV or go for a hike or, you know, there's just so many different things that kids can do. Um, in general, we believe letting kids create something that is meaningful to them, like a game or a story, is the best way to get them hooked. Um, what we see is that when kids make something that they're proud of, they get very excited, right? And they want to show mom and dad, they want to show their friends, and then they want to make the next thing that is even better. Um, so whether it's with our platform or somebody else's, I think, you know, the core of it should be focused on creativity with code and with making things that, you know, the kids are excited about. I think this is a very good question because uh, I, I truly believe that many parents, they see this importance, but they may want to find out the best way to motivate their children. And I think Grant, you mentioned about the key uh, approach to, to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Alan, yeah. You have a, Alan please uh, go ahead. Um, yeah, so uh, the youngest kids, I mean, there are kids as young as three on CodeSpark, but they're generally getting help from their parent. I would say, you know, uh, mostly kids who are doing it on their own are five and older. Um, some four-year-olds can do it with a little help, but they'll get stuck at some point. Five is definitely generally okay. Excellent. Um, so... Grant, as an advisor for our pro, um, so how, how do you see this uh, movement is going to get along, uh, um, I mean, uh, as a part of the movement, coding movement in the world? So our pro is only one part of this movement. So how do you see as a uh, Hong Kong, we have this community, we've been here for around six to seven years. People come and go, they have different ventures. We are just trying to bring up the awareness. How, how any advice for us since you are the advisor? So we need advice to, to, to do it because uh, we are always uh, touching the pyramid, the first step. People, they yeah. Need, yeah. So what's your advice? Well, us? I think the key to making this a, a movement that, um, you know, grows and has longevity, right? That lasts for a long time is uh, two things. Teacher training you know, helping teachers that haven't had exposure to computer science understand that it's not scary and that it's actually something that they can teach with a little bit of training. Um, one of the advantages of CodeSpark is that the app does a lot of work for teachers. And so it's very easy for them to get started. Um, you know, it's a little different, like Scratch is a good tool, but it requires more training to use it well, right? Um, but so one thing is teacher training. The other thing is, I think the attitude about coding in, in schools and even at home needs to be a little bit different. And what I mean by that is, um, I'm gonna turn in the light, there we go. Um, cool. What I mean is right now, most people think of coding as something that you do just like you do coding and that's it, right? It doesn't really connect to other subjects. But in our opinion, coding is best when you use it for a project to, in your history class or in your uh, language arts class or in your you know, social studies class, whatever it is, right? And I think the more that we can get people to think about coding as a way to build a project or to problem solve um, for other subjects, the more use it will get and the stickier 
the idea of using coding every day will be. Does that make sense? That makes sense. So teacher training and also connected to different subjects and uh, turn those uh, story and ideas into something that they, they, are, they are already in the curriculum. So that will make it more uh, influential. Yeah, really cool. We, we, we got your point. Good advice. So um, I, I'm actually more interested about uh, the, the other two platforms that you mentioned. First of all, I'm pretty surprised that 53% uh, of your user are girls. So it sounds like the girls are dominating uh, the community now. So well, it's, a it's actually the natural percentage of girls. In the world, there are slightly more girls than boys. Uh, and, and so, but in order to achieve that, we had to make the app very friendly to girls. Boys, uh, you know, are encouraged to enter coding uh, by teachers and families very naturally. Girls, not as much. So, and it starts at a very young age. Um, also, girls care about different things. Like, they, they actually, it's very important for them that you be able to use coding in a way that's creative. Um, and fortunately, that's exactly what it's for, but um, we don't always tell people that. I think you're right. I think I just look at the audience today. Most of them, they're boys in here. In Hong Kong. But I have to say, in our community, we, we actually have quite a number of uh, our female members. Ellen has a question for you. It appears to be a yeah. good one. That's a great one. So our platform is very well, uh, so we've used it with literally thousands of kids who have ADHD, dyslexia, um, autism, anything related to reading challenges or attention challenges, our platform works really well because there's no words. You just focus on problem solving and creating. Um, and I'm happy to, you know, if you want to like, uh, you know, um, you, you know, I can share my email at the end. And if you want to find out more about that, I'm, ha I'm happy to talk about it. But yes, the platform has been used many, many times with ADHD kids. And very yeah, successfully. Yeah, Alan is a great uh, innovator in Hong Kong. He has his own business, a father of two children. And again, he's, I, I know he's doing a PhD in a, in a university. So, so really cool. Um, my question very is cool. about, about uh, you have mentioned about this uh, girl scouts and called uh, ninjas. So can you let us yeah. know about these uh, two initiatives, uh, uh, as you can see, because we are not aware of this in Hong Kong. Yeah, so I don't, do you have Boy Scouts or anything like that in Hong Kong? Oh, we have Boy Scouts, so it's the same thing, is it? Oh. It's, it's basically the same thing. Uh, Girl Scouts is very big in the United States. There's two million girls who are members. Um, so we have a, part, a five year partnership with them. We designed nine coding merit badges for them. Um, and it's by grade level, so we did you know, there's one set of badges for kindergarten and first grade, another set for second and third grade, and another set for fourth and fifth grade. Um, so that's that's the partnership there. Uh, and that's a national partnership, but uh, will be global eventually. And then Code Ninjas, um, let's see. It's, do you know Kuban? Nope. <laughs> the, or, uh, I'm trying to think. Well, you have lots of after school, like, you know, cram schools, right? Where you go after school to study math or English or geography or whatever it is. Right. Uh, code Ninjas is like that. It's a place where you go after school to learn coding. Um, and our partnership with them is that we provide the platform and curriculum for their young kids. I see, I see. But so they're, they're cur oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so maybe we can uh, connect with uh, the girl or boy scout in Hong Kong um, to for the upcoming like outcook event and uh, to maybe give them badges. Maybe that's a good idea because it's been doing it in the states already. Yeah, that could be. Yeah, and I know boy scouts are starting to do some coding uh, as well, and it's you know it's a big network, so it's a good way to spread your message, right? Excellent. I have to mention that we have an event in uh, July. You can see that from Meetup. So the event is a uh, collaborator with uh, the, the Women's Foundation in Hong Kong. I think the Women's Foundation is a global thing. So, so they, they have a program called uh, Girls Go Tech. So we are providing uh, them the first uh, coding lesson. And we believe uh, there will be more uh, lessons like this. 
So it's important to collaborate with uh, like a different entity that can keep the program uh, like a continuously running. Yeah. All right. I think due to the time, I we can take one last questions. Uh, okay. To start with, I would like to ask, uh, I would say more like a kind of future type question. So the question is this. So when I look at your uh, number, this is really truly amazing. So you have uh, two, 2.5 million uh, per month. So now given that these are the, the children, they're falling in love with coding, and we expect these people maybe within 10 or 20 years, they will go to the job market. And today when we look at uh, Google, when we look at Apple, everybody, every company is saying we don't have people. We need a lot more people. So how do you see the demand and supply that we are now training a lot of young people? And uh, yeah. would that be filling up the gap or would that be the gap that cannot be filled? Or would that be the case that in the future, a lot of it will be automated? You don't need this group of people. So how do you see that? It's a good question. All of those outcomes are possible. Um, here's what I think. I think it's very hard to say what the job market is going to be for today's kindergartner, right? Um, today's five-year-old is going to work in a world that's very different from what we have today. And, you know, the pace of change globally is only accelerating. It's, it's faster every year. However, um, I believe that even though uh, for example, right now, politically, the U.S. and China aren't getting along and it's not a great time. And we have a lot of, you know, issues in, in the United States politically. I believe the big picture of how the world connects to each other, like that's going to continue to move forward, right? It's just, it might slow down a little bit, but it's it's already like businesses are gonna keep doing what they need to do to be successful. And that means they're gonna be global and connected. Um, so I'm not exactly sure if kids need to be sophisticated software programmers, but I do know they need to know how software works. And even if AI starts writing a lot of software, you're still going to need people who understand how to think of software as a tool for problem solving and can apply that tool in creative ways. So, you know, what I believe is that we're helping create the most technologically sophisticated and connected generation in history. And we're going to create a generation that kind of believes in unlimited solutions and that is willing to work with people anywhere on the planet, right? Um, and so that's really exciting to me. You know, when I, when I get depressed about protests or, uh, you know, democracy uh, clashes and things like that, I think about the kids and what they're learning today and how they're much more likely to work together than maybe my generation, you know? So, so we'll see. Um, also, I tend, you know, it's reasonable to be a little bit nervous about AI, but I'm mostly optimistic about it. I think AI will create more jobs than it destroys. We just have to be ready for those new jobs. Amazing. First of all, um, on behalf of uh, Alpha Hong Kong and all the parents and educators in Hong Kong who believe in this uh, coding uh, movement, uh, we want to say thank you for Grant for your excellent uh, sharing today. Given uh, just a short period of time, you managed to address so many uh, challenging questions from us, from our parents here. So we want to say thank you. Your uh, voice has been heard. We have recorded a session. We will share, send you the, the link and you'll be up there on Meetup. So for those who miss uh, the session to listen to have interaction with Grant today, uh, don't feel uh, uh, discouraged. You can join us in the in the upcoming event. And again, just like what Grant is saying, uh, the world is uh, fully connected. The world will be dominate, dominated by technology. There's no turning back. So it's very important for our children to know exactly what this software is about, no matter which discipline they're going to be. And I hope, Grant, you can, uh, when you see the outcome, people in US, let them know. Hong Kong has a bunch of uh, great people here. We are trying to do our best to, to do the connection. Thank you, Grant. Thank you so much. It was my honor to be part of this and 
And for those of you who, who stayed, even though I was quite late, thank you so much. I, I appreciate it. Uh, you know, sometimes technology is not our friend, but uh, you know, it, I, I made it and it's so lovely to talk with you all. And I, I hope that everyone is safe and healthy and, and with your families there. Um, this is a crazy year in human history, but um, you know, with creativity, and uh, taking care of each other, we'll, we'll all get through it. So thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. We know that you're in California time, uh, which is a GMT minus eight. So this is a very late uh, on your side. And love to see your California coastline at the back. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. All right. Bye, everybody. Take care. Take care. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Alan. Bye.